Welcome to Cheese in Depth. I'm Michael Landis, and today we have the Taste of Portugal with Michelle Buster. And uh, this is a unique uh, direction for focusing on these exclusive cheeses from Portugal. And I think it's really fun that we bring in something that typically you just don't see and you're sitting around in your grocery store. This is something that you really have to do a little bit of work to be able to find, but they are definitely worth every every little bit of hunting for them. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and she's going to go ahead and start us off. Michelle? Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, be here and thank you, Michael, for uh, hosting this. Um, I'm excited to talk about Portuguese cheese with you. It's uh, been a labor of love over more than 20 years. And quite frankly, it isn't what pays the bills for Forever Cheese. It's more about the principle of showcasing some of these amazing cheeses and hoping that little by little, we get people to understand them more, to look for them more, um, and because they're just super, super special. So welcome to those who know me and who have come back to listen to another one. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Buster and I have been selling cheese every day for about 27 years now. Um, I started with zero knowledge um, and just kind of learned hands-on every single day from 1993 on. Um, my company, I, with my partner, Pierluigi, we focus on only certain countries, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Croatia. Italy, because my, my partner's family is Italian and they make a very unique Pecorino Romano in the countryside of Rome. We do his other family cheeses. And then I wanted Spanish cheese since I had lived in Spain for three years. And what embarked on a search for Manchego led to a whole treasure trove of another 50 cheeses that we carry now and other accompaniments. Portugal was <laughs> part of the Iberian Peninsula. Nobody was paying any attention to it except the Portuguese community. So one day we decided that we would take them under our wings and try and create a market for them outside of that community. And then um, Croatia, because I fell in love with the Adriatic and then learned that Pashkisir was something I didn't want to live without and I had to make others want. So let's dive right in. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, you just um, write to us in the chat. We can answer them before, during, after. Um, Portugal, there's a lot of cheeses that are made also in the Azores. This first, these slides are cows on the island of San Jorge, which is one of the cheeses that we're going to talk about. When you, before I get into that, just, you know, because sometimes I get caught up in the lives of my producers and sharing that, there are a lot of different ways to put together a cheese plate. So when you're trying to figure out how you want to do it, there's no right or wrong way. And there's no just one way. You may want to group cheeses by country. You might want to group cheeses by milk type. You know, very often if you've heard of a vertical wine tasting, so it's the same wine different years. You could pick a milk type like all sheep and do a young, a medium aged, and a very aged cheese. You could do all sheep, but from different regions. You can do um, a lot of different things. You might pick a category, all things that are beer washed or just washed cheeses, some with wine, some with beer, some of others. Um, you could do it on the basis of milk types, cow versus goat versus sheep versus buffalo. And hey, I had some camel's milk cheese uh, last week. That was a hard one for me to do, but um, it tasted like any other cheese. Um, so there's, you can play with things. Sometimes I get the question often, do I eat the rind? And that answer is, has many uh, caveats, it depends. So if it's a very soft rind, um, you might want to eat it. If it has a very plasticky feel and it tastes like plastic, then it might not be something that you'd enjoy eating. If it's a white mold rind, they're more likely the ones that people want to eat or a wash rind, but it doesn't mean you have to. So I always tell people to try the cheese, try the rind and try it all together. And then you make the decision whether you like it. Some cheeses as a nature, like a washed rind cheese, have mold marbled into the rind. And if you don't like the flavor of mold, 
you're not going to like the cheese with the moldy rind. Other people really like that flavor profile. So it's very subjective. And there's a lot of books on it and a lot of books are very opinionated. And I say, you make your own decision, just like you decide if you're going to have white wine with your steak and red wine with your fish. It's a matter of taste. It's true that some combinations can be overpowering and kind of it's a, it's a lot of um, give and take and trial and error. And then we see what works. Mold. Mold and its function on cheese. Uh, mold is actually a really important part of cheese making. When you make cheese, you're taking milk, you're adding something that's going to turn the liquid into a solid, and we call that rennet. It could be microbial, vegetable, or animal. And then when the cheese, you pour it out, you put it into a mold, and you generally salt it in some way. Either you dry salt it, or you put it in a salt bath. And that starts the setting of the rind, and it's beginning so that the cheese can start aging. When you put the cheese into the um, cold storage or cave or aging room, there's a lot of humidity. The humidity is something that welcomes mold. It actually foments the growth of mold. And certain cheeses, like a Spanish cheese called garrocha, they leave the molds in the, in the refrigerator because they want the rind to get filled with that mold. And those molds help determine the flavor and the character of the finished product. We don't always see it because the cheeses are generally like brushed off to make beautiful before they're shipped. Um, but it, there's often that if you don't put a chemical agent on the rinds, it's gonna start to grow again. Is your cheese bad if it has the mold? In my opinion, that shows your cheese is good. It shows you you have a living, breathing organism that's not filled with chemicals. And well, you know, certain rinds you're not going to eat anyway, so you just wipe it off or you cut it off. And even if you want to eat the rind, that's, you know, kind of part of it. But if we go to the market and we buy an apple and the apple has a bruise, you don't return the apple. You try maybe not to buy it, but it might happen anyway. You cut around it. It's the same thing with the mold. If you don't like that moldy flavor and you don't want to eat it, you cut that rind off or you wipe it off but it's something that shows that the cheese is alive. And there's not really a color of mold that is bad. There's only a brown, very hairy mold that we call cat hair, which is something we don't wanna have. But if I've learned something in all of these years is I've seen every color of the rainbow mold. And I can't stress enough every single time that it should just be embraced and you know worked around. And, and it comes for me as a kid, growing up with you know, cream cheese that was green and I immediately throw it away until learning that, well, cream cheese is not really cheese, it's melted everything else to just cut around the spot of mold and keep going. Um, cheese care, because you might have leftover cheese with what you have, um, wrapping things, firm cheeses, I like to wrap in foil or in cheese paper. Cheese paper is great for any cheeses, but sometimes when your cheeses have been wrapped for a long time, uh, you might want to face them, so you might want to shave the first layer off, and that way the cheese will taste more fresh. Um, and sometimes it gets a white film of mold there too, so you just kind of cut that or plane it with a cheese plane off and it's back and it's brand new again. If it's a firm cheese and it starts to dry out, you can rub some olive oil on it, and that also absorbs back into the cheese and helps it get more sprightly and, and better with there. So there are a lot of ways of cheese taking, but in general, you should um, try and buy only what you need for a week or two, not hold on to it for life because a cheese is better fresh, freshly cut. Um, we can't always do that, so you might order from afar. If you get a vacuum sealed cheese, you want to take off that vacuum seal and let your cheese breathe for at least an hour um, so that it will kind of come back to the life. It's, I, it's like being shut in your room with the lights out and the windows closed and the shades down and it kind of takes away your breath and makes you pale and pallid. And so when you open that door, you take off that plastic, then you're coming back to life. Um, it's very important. And it's very important to try cheeses at room temperature. The colder things are, um, the less flavor that you can have.
So with that, um, we can start and talk about some of the cheeses and what they are. And um, the today we only have one accompaniment. We have um, an Ocani from Portugal, which will go fabulously with every and all of the cheeses that we have. A lot of people ask about pairings. And, um, Michael was talking about a book he has coming out with beer and there's just so many different pairings that you can do with things. And uh, I'll try and think of a few more as we're, we're talking about each of the different cheeses, but you can pair with wine, you can pair with beer. I've done scotch and um, single malt scotch um, tastings with cheese, um, honey, of course, with so many things. Uh, there's different jams, but you have to look at the type of cheese that you have. Um, whether it might work because some of your more aged cheeses, uh, the, if they have any like little crystals in them, which we call terracine, the, the sweetness of those crystals clash with some sweetness of the jams. So then I'd go with something more like a honey or a dried fruit, like a fig or something like that. Um, okay, well, why don't we go to the island of uh, Fayel in the Azores? <laughs> 